Florida Keys, a world-famous fishing and diving destination. It's the third largest barrier reef in the world. It supports basically an annual economy of about $6 billion a year, but it also suffers from significant use from a regional population on the order of about 7 million people in the three county South Florida area. As Florida's population has increased, the health of its coral reefs, which form the foundation for the state's large fishing industry, has drastically declined. With it, so have fish populations. Man loves to fish, catches too many fish, therefore the numbers go down. To better understand how fish populations are doing, a team of scientists dives regularly to conduct a census of the fish that live on the reef. The main reason that we're out here counting fish is really to try to get some better understanding of what's happening with these coral reef fish populations. And the best way to do that is to put divers in the water and actually have them go and count and size the stuff that they're seeing. To collect this data in remote locations like the dry Tortugas, scientists use a highly efficient and streamlined process. Go divers, go. Kind of like a paramilitary assault on marine resources because we're doing on the order of you know 100 scientific dives a day so the process of having a custom ship with a very skilled captain and crew with highly trained divers gives us great flexibility and latitude to sample large areas accurately and provide information really that nobody has been able to capture before what will the divers find are fish populations recovering in South Florida. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Dry Tortugas National Park is one of the lesser known jewels in the national park system. It is famous for its 19th century Fort Jefferson, a remote Union outpost located on an island 70 miles west of Key West. Most visitors come to the park on a day trip to see the fort, the thousands of birds that nest on a nearby island each spring, and to snorkel around the fort's moat walls. But only a few visitors get to see what makes up the vast majority of the park. 97% or more of this park is actually underwater. That's what we are out here to study. The park's roughly 100 square miles of magnificent underwater resources make up the westernmost part of Florida's reef chain. The living reef starts about Key Biscayne, which is about 30 miles north of Key Largo, and then runs uh, at least to the Dry Tortugas, so about 270 kilometers southwest on the southwest Florida shelf. The health of the reefs and the fish that live there has drastically declined over the last half century. With more and more people arriving in South Florida, fishing pressures increased dramatically. In the early years, no data was collected on the fisheries. It wasn't until the late 1970s that scientists began to analyze how fish populations were doing. Now, each year, Researchers from various organizations and agencies dive in to count the fish on the reefs. What we're hoping more than anything is that this research will give us some understanding about how these resources are doing. When I say resources, in this case, I'm talking primarily about coral reef fish communities, particularly with an emphasis on the exploited species like snappers and groupers. 
To cover as large of an area as possible in Dry Tortugas National Park, the highly skilled science divers have developed a unique method to collect their data. They spend one to two weeks at sea on a chartered liveaboard, making multiple dives each day. A regular sport diving charter, we typically tie to buoys where we're moored, uh, so the dive times are very regimented. Um, with a group of divers like this, we dive all day long. We dive with five teams of divers rather than all the divers getting off the boat at one time and then getting back on the boat at one time. We do that for a couple of different reasons. One is to get more dive sites in during the day, and the other one is that the divers can each see something different and they get more ability to count fish in different locations. Captain Frank uses a commercial charting program to find the predetermined dive sites. The scientists can give me a list of where they want to go and they give that to me electronically, we insert it into the computer, it pops up what's called a waypoint on the screen and then I can move the boat to the waypoint. I use a depth sounder to search around for something interesting near the waypoint, be it a ledge, coral reef, a pinnacle, something like that. We don't want to just drop them in sand. Uh, sand isn't where we're going to find our fish. Team five against the wall, team five. Divers on the wall, please. And it kind of works like a factory. Basically, we have five teams. Each team consists of four divers, so two, two buddy pairs. Um, Captain Frank takes the boat to the GPS point. Divers ready? Ready. Yeah. Roger that. We have a pinnacle at 60 feet of water to the bottom, 40 feet of water to the top. Go divers, go. Each buddy pair has a dive flag and they descend to their site and they tie off the flag. And then they swim about 50 feet apart and each of them imagines a circle with a radius of about 25 feet. So ideally those circles will be touching just at the very edge. So they can still see each other. So if someone runs into problems, something happens, the other diver can offer some assistance, but they're far enough away that the circles do not overlap. So each sample then is independent. So then once the divers are situated and they've figured out what their cylinders are, they start counting fish. takes an experienced diver, takes a diver who can identify fish, and then what we do is we have this extensive training program that each fish diver goes through to standardize how they estimate the sizes of fish and whether or not they're able to count the numbers of fish. That, that sounds easy, like one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, not so much actually. Occasionally you have huge schools go through hundreds of fish and you know, how many fish is that? You can't count each one. So you have to have a good eye of, you know, how to estimate abundances of fish. We try to start with the most commercially important species, things like the big snappers and the big groupers. When we see them, we count them immediately and we estimate their sizes immediately because in many cases they tend to be a little skittish towards divers and are more likely to swim off quickly. And so we want to capture those as immediately as we can, and then go through the rest of the species um, that we see in the area. Usually starting with the bigger things that are left, uh, moving down to the smaller species, because the smaller species are much less likely to swim away. Each diver takes down a measuring stick, which is called an all-purpose tool. It's uh, sort of like a T-stick that's about a meter long, marked with 10 centimeter increments up the meter stick, and then the T part is about 30 centimeters across with a ruler that actually has centimeters on it so we can see. And what we use that stick for is to help us estimate the sizes of these individual fish because size structure is very, very important. Large fish tend to be much older and basically the number of babies that they make is much, much larger than smaller fish. And so knowing that there are four fish is important, but knowing that there are four big fish is much different than knowing that there are four small fish. Also, when divers go in the water, they're not just collecting information about the fish because the fish, you know, aren't acting alone, they're responding to their environment. We're also collecting data about the habitat and uh, the water quality. And we're looking at that data in relationship to any trends that we see in the fish populations to see whether or not it's actually something happening to the habitat that's changing the distribution of fishes that we see. It's important because the coral reefs are actually the structures that allow the, the nurturing and, and raising of juvenile fishes and allowing 
a larger fish is to say hide from predators. You've probably heard of the integral web of life. Each thing has its place. Once the divers are done counting, it's time to head back to the surface. They meet at the center where their flag is. There's a GPS attached to the buoy itself at the surface, so we have the exact location of where those two counts occurred. But after that, they all come up together. Roger, divers on the surface. We'll go pick them up. And then the boat pulls around. Recover divers. picks them up and they get on board and do it all over again five or six times a day. <laughs> a lot's relief, no cooper. Oh, okay. 26 feet, 20 minutes, 2,400 pounds. So it's kind of a cool process that um, we're just constantly dumping divers, picking them up, and within the course of a day, we'll hit 25 sites, and that's 25 sites times four divers, so that's a whole lot of dives and a whole lot of hours underwater that we get by doing this kind of cruise. When a team is back on the boat, they enter the data recorded on the dives. The less glamorous side of marine biology involves entering and managing all of this data. So after we get out of the water, people need to come in, sit, in front of the computers and, uh, and enter their data, double check it to make sure that they've, they've done it correctly. At the end of the trip, it'll go back to each individual agency. They will double check it again to make sure that the data's been entered correctly. And then it gets all collected and, and put in a, a central database where all the agencies have access to it. Scientists from four different agencies and institutions are along on this particular trip to collect data. They work for the National Park Service, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. One of the things that I first noticed about this particular group of divers is the cooperation level between different agencies, both federal and state, is very high. In other places that I've been, in other states that we've worked in, uh, particularly along the Gulf Coast, it's very difficult to get all those agencies working together to make a mission like this gel like this particular mission does. For many years, the various groups were counting fish independently, often duplicating their efforts. So we got together and did a big meeting, compared kind of the data that we accumulated through the years, and decided that it will be more efficient to actually gather other forces and our crews and uh, survey all together 